So you've probably encountered some elements of the 20th century philosophy that were, well, weird. That gender is performative, or that natural sciences are a social construct, or what Derrida said, that there's nothing outside of text, or basically everything else Derrida ever said. Many philosophical theories, especially in the latter half of the past century, appear either to make little sense, or just be useless thought exercises at how to connect meaningless things. Part of that problem can be explained by the professionalization of philosophy, which means that it's scholars who are writing for scholars, and there is no way for a layperson to get through it. And that's where we come in, to make it all accessible to you. Oh, and by we, I mean there's two of us. Like this. See? And today we're going to do something different. Though we usually focus on philosophy and social sciences and how they relate to climate crisis and politics, we need to backtrack a bit and do a video on so-called pure philosophy. Because around the middle of this century there was a revolution that basically overturned the whole history of Western thought. And surprise surprise, we don't mean postmodernism. Conservatives like to use it for scaremongering, like how the left wants to destroy the Western culture using fully automated luxury gay postmodern neo-Marxism, or whatever word Salah Jordan Peterson is using these days. And the reason they can get away with it is that postmodernism is an answer to a question. And the answer is, well, basically yes, but it's a bit more complex than that. As you can see, without the question itself, it's hard to understand anything. And the question was posed by a different kind of philosophy that you might not have ever heard of. Structuralism. You see, we believe that structuralism is the key to understanding 20th century thinking. Because even though we live in a world shaped by the 20th century, our common sense thinking is still stuck way back in the 19th century. And it has roots running deeper than that. 2400 years deeper, in fact. And it was actually structuralism that made this thinking have a great fall. Postmodernism was just there trying to put it together again where it became a talking point in a culture war. And even though a part of this outrage comes from an ethical choice, which we'll discuss towards the end, most of it boils down to a lack of knowledge. So today we'll discuss how we used to think the world is like, what made us change our minds, and finally, what is it that postmodernism was actually trying to do. Most importantly, we'll give you a new way to think about the world. We can rebuild you. We have the philosophy. We can make you better, stronger, and more structural. And no worries, even though we'll get a bit abstract, it's gonna be fine. You'll get the whole premium think that through mind, spa, and massage. So that all the knowledge gets absorbed through the pores in your being. Even though eventually you'll find out that your being is not really there. But first, let's go back in history of philosophy, like all the way back. Being versus non-being, an easy victory. First, let's ask ourselves, what's the point of studying history of philosophy? If we want to understand how, say, proteins work, we study modern chemistry, not alchemy. So wouldn't it be better to learn about the current state of philosophy? No, and there are two reasons why. First, philosophy isn't about making definite conclusions about the world. It's basically worthless to state that René Descartes said that my thinking means that I exist, or that, according to Spinoza, everything was made of the same stuff, or that Immanuel Kant said that the only thing we can know are phenomena. It's not something you can use in your life, in the same way you'd use the knowledge of amino acids to create a working vegan diet. What's important is, Philosophy is knowing the thought process that made these people come to these conclusions. Philosophy is studying the different ways of thinking. The second reason is that the history of philosophy can be thought of as a dialogue beginning all the way back in the 6th century BCE in ancient Greece. Yes, that's a very Eurocentric point of view, we'll discuss that at the end. The dialogue is basically a series of philosophers saying, yes, but actually, to their predecessors. So if you try to enter at one point without the knowledge of what was said before, you can't really follow what's being said, and you're gonna be very difficult to talk to. So at the dawn of philosophy there were the ancient Greeks, and they were obsessed about one thing, understanding the stuff that everything is made from, what they called arche. Why? Because when a carpenter knows everything there is to know about wood, they know all there is to know about carpentry. 
So if you know everything there is to know about stuff that the world is made of, you know everything about, well, everything. Maybe you've heard in history class that the first Greek philosophers kept focusing on elements, that depending on who you asked, everything was supposed to be made out of water, or air, or fire, or earth. While it's a good way to summon Captain Planet, it's a horrible oversimplification. It's especially unfair to the last two characters, who are also believed to be opposites. The fire guy was Heraclitus, who talked about how everything changes, and the earth guy, Parmenides, talked about how nothing changes. That's another oversimplification, because they were both talking about the same thing, just from different ends. Today, however, we're going to focus only on Parmenides, and on his idea of being, which created the world we lived in for these good 2400 years. And he said, It is necessary to say, and to think, that what is, is. For it is to be, but nothing it is not. You might be thinking, Wow, non-existent things don't exist? The T3 guys blew my mind once again. These absolute bangers are why I love philosophy. But wait, hold on. It's not as obvious as it sounds. A bit earlier, he also said, Neither could you apprehend what is not, for it is not to be accomplished, nor could you indicate it. First, to make it easy on the grammar, let's call what is a being, and nothing, or what is not, a non-being. Okay, so let's say we have a country, Norway. But there is no anti-Norway. Let's call it uh, Weynor. Well, Weynor doesn't exist. But it's not nothing. It's something that has some attributes. It exists as a concept, just not in the physical world. So it exists the same way that Tolkien's Middle Earth exists. Just that a lot less was said about Weynor. But that's a difference in quantity, not quality. So there's a big difference between a non-existent being and a non-being. The second one can't have any properties. Can you imagine such a nothing? If you imagined emptiness, you're wrong. There is still time and space. So maybe you can try to imagine the hypothetical state of the universe before the Big Bang, where everything, including space and time, was compressed to a single... thing? Well, still no. It doesn't have many attributes, but it still exists. In philosophy, we could call it a monad. The only thing that exists, both metaphysically and logically. So there isn't even any idea of emptiness to contrast it with. It's something. Okay, so a non-being is something that isn't a thing. What's worse, it's a non-thing that doesn't even exist. So, the only thing we can say about non-being is that it's nothing or a non-being. If that sounds like a circular definition here, that's because it is. Non-being is just a word. It doesn't relate to anything in the world. By definition. But also, not to any concept, except for itself. It's internally inconsistent. You can say nothing in the same way you can say square circle. And it means just as much. It's just a word. So, to sum up, being is something that exists, either physically or conceptually, while non-being is just a word. And for ancient Greeks, words were basically mouth sounds compared to real philosophy. Sure, there was a group of thinkers called the Sophists who actually tried to focus on language, but Plato dunked on them so hard in his dialogues that they got cancelled for 2400 years. Yep, that number is not a coincidence. And then there came the Abrahamic god who said, I am that I am. So, in the contest of being and non-being, it was god versus a mouth sound. And the battle was won. Essentialism. Things inside themselves. Okay, since we know that only beings exist, let's look at why they are a particular kind of being and not a different one. Why is a mug a mug? The way of thinking called essentialism says that the most important attributes of a given being, its essence, are inside of it. Well, that makes sense. If I take a mug in my hand, it doesn't change. I'm not projecting any mugness into it. If I put it in a cupboard for 50 years, it will still be a mug. So the properties that make it a mug seem to be contained in it and seem to be permanent. Aristotle, who devised basically the whole dictionary of philosophy, would separate this mug and all the other beings into two components, matter and form. 
Matter is what the given being is made of, while the form is the shape that the matter has. So a mug is made out of porcelain and it has a shape of an empty cylinder closed off on one end with a handle on the side. If you change the form, like close or open the cylinder on both sides, or change the matter, like made it from silk or hydrogen, it wouldn't be a mug anymore. How can it be changed otherwise? It's relatively simple. I can smash it against the wall. And it's not a mug anymore. So we have an external self-contained being, the wall, meeting a self-contained being, the mug, and affecting it, by shattering. The matter is still there, but the form is all over the floor. Everything's nice and simple, with self-contained objects interacting with other objects. If we work out the details of those objects and their interactions, we should be golden. If it sounds intuitively understandable, there's a good reason for that. We live in an Aristotelian world, partially because of Thomas Aquinas, who recovered Aristotle's system from the Arabic world and made it into the philosophical underpinning of the Catholic Church, and also made God the most beingest being of all beings, like the gold standard of being. But then the 20th century happened, and nothing came back with a vengeance, and a thirst for blood. And we didn't notice it, until it was too late. The non-being of language. Everything started out innocently enough. The 19th century was just concluded and it has created most of the world as we know it. Sex, family, industry, the state and the city, capitalism and socialism, history and religion, and our whole conception of almost everything. The world back then was surprisingly similar to what we commonly believe in now. Back then all was mostly simple and tidy. It was only in the 20th century that philosophy and physics and biology and art and what else became weird. The main reason for this normality was that Parmenides was still king, despite all the changes philosophy went through, only being existed, and nothing was still just a mouth sound. So it's fitting that the crack through which nothing seeped back into our world was still study of mouth sounds. Linguistics. We're going to spoil things here. It eventually turns out that the language is very, very, very important. It's not some transparent medium that you use to express your thoughts. Your thoughts are language-based. In fact, there is very little outside of language. Sure, you have your own world of internal impressions or sense data, but they aren't really thoughts. They're more of like crude intuitions. You can't hold many of them in your mind at one time, while you can easily juggle multiple words and concepts. And that's because, compared to other species, our human language is something very unique. It's our operating system. It doesn't just help us think. It's what makes our thinking possible. So it's not just a tool of understanding the world, or at least not a passive tool. It's a tool that shapes us to an extraordinary degree, both individually and as a civilization. When all you've got is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. So if language is the only tool you've got for understanding the world, then everything looks like a word. Or rather, we need to make it into a word, so that we can do anything with it. This is why it's impossible to understand 20th century philosophy without the philosophy of language. And by studying language, the Swiss philosopher Ferdinand de Saussure discovered something very unusual about no, no, not the existence, or at least, not yet. You see, earlier researchers studied the creation of words as an evolutionary process, how they changed over time. So, for example, starting from cavemen until now, the words evolved more or less like this. Ugg, ugg, mug, mug, mug. I mean, we're not linguists or archaeologists, so we're not sure if it happened exactly that way. But we feel pretty confident. We've watched quite a few episodes of the Flintstones, so, you know, we've done our research. This is called diachronical thinking, or thinking in terms of time. Okay, but while this may work for history, that's not how language actually is. Like, when we're learning our first language as babies, or a second language sometime later on, we don't study the history of it. Yet, we still can master it. And this was what interested the Saussure. How does a language actually work? So instead of looking at the changes diachronically, he decided to look synchronically. 
Not that how worlds relate to each other by their shared history, where they branched out from their evolutionary ancestors, but how they relate to each other right now. And when you look at the word mug in this way, you don't do it by comparing it to its parent and grandparent, but to its present-time neighbors. Whenever I say the word mug, I also sort of call up the words bug or mud to show that I'm not talking about them, but about something similar to them. The word mug doesn't exist by itself. It lies somewhere next to bug and mud, and it's this difference in the general proximity of these words that makes it a mug. It's part of a network of words. In a way, it's less important what mug is, and way more important what it is not. And it's not all the other words. Here someone might say that it's only sophistry. See that word? Sophistry? All the negative connotations? That's Plato's doing and his dislike of language. One could say that we've just reversed the perspective, that if we wanted to point out a letter in an alphabet, then instead of saying A is A, we're saying A is not B, not C, not D, and all the way up to not Z. But what you have in this example is not really a network of letters, it's just a simple set of them, where they're all treated as equal. Language is a whole different beast. It's a network spread out over some area, or let's finally say it, a structure. And it's the structure that decides the place and role of each and every word. Sure, the word mug is not one of all the other words, but it is so in its very own unique way. The relation of not being between mug and any other particular word is different. Some words are further away from it than the others. And it's that varied distance between it and every other word that puts mug in its proper place. Okay, so it's not being something that decides what a word is, but it not being everything else. There's no central word that is, which everything is centered around. Everything is the not being of everything else. You might think that we're getting dangerously close to non-being here, but hey, mug and bug and mud are still just words or collection of mouth sounds, the same way that non-being is. So the Parmedesian existence is safe, but unfortunately the Sassio took non-being one step further. Mug, bug and mud are sounds or symbols, and they're like half of a word, or a sign. It's the top half, which the Sassio called the signifier. The bottom half of it is called the signified. And it's whatever the word refers to, either something physical or a concept. And surely, if you look at the signifieds of mug and mud or dug, there's like a world of difference. It's only the sounds that are similar. But not exactly. The crack to non-being has been opened and we can see that trickle coming in. Sure, a drinking vessel isn't a mixture of earth and water, or the past tense of dig, in the same way, it isn't a donkey, or an angel, or the concept of time. But our mug also isn't a cup, or a glass, or a plate. It's not only sounds that can be placed within a structure of differences, but also meanings. This leads to a dangerous conclusion, that just as with words, every meaning relies not on itself, but on all the other meanings. Which means there really isn't a central meaning that all the other meanings are built around. Instead, they're built on non-being other meanings. That's a scary amount of non-being for a word that supposedly exists. But maybe we could keep it contained to linguistics. Because language is just a tool? Yeah, you can already guess that's not going to happen. But before we destroy the 19th century world completely, we need to look a bit closer at the system we're going to use. Because this year separated the structure of language also in two parts. Well, technically three, but we won't care about the last one. Longue and Pahol. Pahol is concrete speech, sentences, texts, video essays. In short, everything that we do say. And language is how we say it. Longue decides the shape of our Pahol. It exists underneath it. This is the structure in structuralism, the invisible way in which language is organized. It's more than just grammar rules. It's the reason that the rules are what they are. The genetic code, the template, how they are created and how they change. 
the very fabric of reality. Yeah, we're not doing linguistics anymore, are we? The non-being of everything. Actually, in the mid-20th century, folks were still doing structuralism mostly in linguistics, which started getting boring, and its limitations were starting to show, mostly because its synchronical approach made it ahistorical. So, because structuralism was unable to understand history, it almost became history. But then came the dark savior of structuralism, the vessel of non-being and the shatterer of Parmenidesian worldview, the big daddy of structuralism, Claude Levi Strauss. You see, Levi Strauss was an ethnologist, so he didn't worry about ahistoricity all that much. It was even a good thing, because if you start studying the culture of some barely known village or tribe, you don't worry about their history. You need to understand their worldview as soon as possible and make it into something comprehensible to other scholars. You need to understand the structure of their society. One of the amazing features of the humanities and social sciences is their potential for cross-pollination. While you can take a methodology from wildly different discipline and apply it to an apparently wildly different field. That was the case with Levi Strauss when he went, what if we treated families as a kind of language? While it initially sounds weird, if we think about it, there are some rules to who can marry whom, which woman gets married to which family and which village. And that creates a network of connections with aunts and nephews and parents-in-law and so on, placing every person in a standing which depends on all the other connections. Every such village would have its own system, its own pahol. And behind every pahol lies a lang, a more universal set of rules on how to speak. If we apply that to family relations, then we discover the grammar of this society, its structure. After all, the rules for marrying and the rules of grammar were invented by people. So it's not a stretch to say that some parts of the lang of language will be similar to the lang of marriage. That was only the beginning, and Levi Strauss didn't stop there. He also looked at myths from different parts of the world. And you know, myths are weird. They are stories where anything can happen. Like, say, goddess of the sun gets upset and goes to sulk in the cave, which plunges the world in darkness, and is only lured out after a different goddess flashes her lady bits. There are different versions of the myth of Amaterasu in the cave, but I'm going with that one. But even this weirdness can be analyzed like a language. Instead of phonemes, we have mythemes, which form a pahol and a lang. The structural approach gives us a better perspective than just analyzing every single myth by itself. And so, ultimately, Levi Strauss started looking at all of these different languages together as an expression of something, some structure that originates somewhere in the human or in the society, but one that is in some way universal. It created all the other social structures that we have, and we can analyze them like a language, but not because they're linguistic. It's because the structure of language is the easiest one to study. We know its goal, we know its structure, so we can see how much of what we know is specific only to language, and how much can be applied to marriages or myths or anything developed by the human mind. And from here on out, the perspective seemed limitless. Levi Strauss became a full-fledged anthropologist, studying everything having to do with humans, and structuralism expanded to every nook and cranny of humanities and social sciences. Someone might ask, wait, what? You mean that before this whole structuralism thing was developed, no scholar ever chose to look at the big picture? Of course, that's not the case. These kinds of holistic perspectives arose independently in different scientific fields, but what structuralism did was to give them a common set of tools which allowed us to translate their results from one field to another. It was possible because all of the sciences, at least the human component of it, were structures. And they were similar because the structure that made humans act is a singular thing. So if we just studied all the cultures everywhere, all the sciences everywhere, all the art everywhere, 
we could ultimately find the holy grail, the answer to life, humanities and everything. The structure of structures. The big question of structuralism. If this sounds like a tall order, well, it was. As we often say on this channel, the universal solution to everything always ends up being a particular solution to some things, and the same was true with structuralism. But before we talk about its downfall, we need to discuss what made it so revolutionary. First off, it completely changed the way we look at the world. It showed that treating the world like a collection of self-contained beings that do stuff is no way to look at the big picture. Until then, the world was usually treated like a billiard's table, where one ball hits another, then that force sends them in a particular direction, and that's it. You just need to multiply it by a lot. Generally, the universe is a machine, and once we know all of its components, well, we'll know how the machine works. As a side note, please remember that we're telling a story here, so we need to omit some details. For example, this mechanistic perspective wasn't universal. In the late 19th century, Darwin's discovery of evolution sent shockwaves everywhere. In philosophy, it created a new way of thinking, vitalism, a belief that the universe can be treated as a living being. And life, as we know, um, finds a way to evolve creatively. If you're interested, you might want to start off with Henry Bergson's Introduction to Metaphysics, which is lighter, and Creative Evolution, which is still not that bad. Actually, if you enjoy our channel, do look up on Bergson and other vitalists. This philosophy is seeing a revival in the form of stuff like New Materialism, which is one of the frameworks we use on this channel. Anyway, back to the story. It's very easy for us to understand the limitations of this essentialist mechanicist perspective, at least now, since we're not really living in it. Imagine trying to understand how a forest works with just an essentialist approach, as just a complex collection of individual organisms or species that interact with each other. And since you believe that the essence of a particular being is located within it and nowhere else, if you want to study the being, you'd need to exclude any external interference. So if you want to understand the essence of a, say, fox, how do you exclude it? How big part of its foxness comes from it living in a forest? If we lock it up in a solid white four square meter room, do we get more foxness or less? Or will nothing change? For an even more extreme version, let's imagine that we're trying to understand the real self-contained nature of a person. If we place them in a sort of zoo, or maybe unthrew, until they are, say, 20 years old, would we learn more of what makes humans human? No, of course not. This person would be so impaired in their functioning that our research would be considered a grievous crime. And this is because we removed the influence of the structure of society on that person. The very structure that person was born to express. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Of course, you could take an essentialist point of view and say that the self-contained human being requires a proper environment to grow. Like a seed needs water and soil. You could say that human needs food to survive, but a culture to develop. And being dependent on these things doesn't make the human, or the fox, any less self-contained. That's a fair answer. But the role of structuralism is not to replace essentialism in each and every case. Both of them have their strengths and their weaknesses. They are different philosophical frameworks, and generally, the more of these we have, the better. As we have said in our video on the Capitalocene, Oh, a side note. In our opinion, some Marxists sometimes tend to overuse dialectical thinking because it's the only philosophical framework they've ever learned by studying, well, Marx. If you feel that about you, then please don't take it the wrong way. Most folks don't know any philosophical frameworks at all, so you are still ahead. But the reason that dialectics seem to explain everything so well is that you only have one thing to compare it to, and that's the everyday common sense thinking and it's absolute rubbish for understanding the world in any kind of systematic sense. But a, say, theology student who only knows neo-scholasticism will also believe that it explains everything perfectly. The truth is, there exist various philosophical frameworks which can be used to understand the world, and all of them are better than common sense thinking. 
While some are clearly better than others, every framework has its strong and weak points. You absolutely can use a wrong tool for the job. It's just going to cost you a lot of effort to make it work, and the results you get will be either overly complicated or not very interesting. And if we look at what structuralism did, it was one hell of a new framework. To put it in one sentence, the essence of a being is not contained within it, but rather in a difference between it and other beings. Or to put it even shorter, a being is determined by what it is not. We could call this, it is not, a constitutive outside. The everything else that makes a being itself. Although this term comes from post-structuralist thinkers, like Jadid Butler or Ernesto Laclau. But you can also interpret it in another, more paradoxical way. While we can point to a difference between two beings, the difference itself doesn't exist. We can say the vowel A or a vowel E in some kind of E eh that's somewhere in the middle, but we can't pronounce the difference between A and E. So in a single sentence, that what is not makes that what is. Sorry Parmenides, don't let that door hit you on the way out. The downfall of structuralism. It should now be clear why we've called structuralism the question of the 20th century. And the question could be, what if things exist outside of themselves? Because that's the actual problem many people have with postmodernism, both its critics and those of you that are struggling to understand it. The question of non-being hasn't been raised only by structuralists, as it's a common topic in 20th century philosophy. But they had by far the biggest impact on humanities and social sciences. In terms of history, structuralism rose to popularity just as existentialism was at its peak, and basically wiped the floor with it. You see, the existentialists were terrified of the potential for human freedom, of the infinite possibilities of having free will, that we could become anyone and do anything, and that it's only our unawareness that keeps us from seeing it all and having a full-blown existential crisis, like all the time. The structuralist simply looked down on them and said, Listen, kiddo, you very well know you are not gonna do all these things. You'll do the whole song and dance, you're gonna have your little crisis, you're gonna be amazed, you're gonna promise yourself how starting tomorrow you'll leave your job, you'll make your dream of becoming a llama farmer in the Andes true. And then, tomorrow comes around, you're gonna wake up as usual, eat the same breakfast as usual, take your morning commute as usual, and stare at Excel sheets for 8 hours. As usual. Because what you are is just an emanation of the structure, and there's no way you can go against it. It's not you who's talking right now, it's the structure. It's not you who's working right now, it's the structure. It's not you who decides your career, it's your limitless potential as a human being. <laughs> just messing with you. It's the structure, of course. Obviously, you can see how the structuralist approach is better for, say, sociology. While existentialism still survives as one of the frameworks, it's mostly being used living our own individual lives, where it's still very relatable. Structuralism, however, ties up many more things much more neatly. The structuralist answer is scary, sure, but it doesn't make it scientifically unviable. However, you might feel that it's also too tidy and too neat. And, well, you are right. The lofty idea of structure of structures never came to be, because the concept of structure itself ultimately turned out to be too limited. This is where post-structuralism comes in. It's hard to define and summarize neatly because it wasn't a singular school of thought, but more like various criticisms of structuralism. Additionally, it falls under the umbrella term of postmodernism, which tends to make it even murkier. But, dear viewer, fear not. We love you, and we care. So much, in fact, that we can give you not one, not two, but three important tips on how to approach post-structuralism. The first is that it added chronological thinking, allowing us to study how the structure changes over time. The second is that it acknowledged how the real world interferes with and makes changes to structure, which in structuralism was neat and self-contained. It only changed according to its own internal rules. And the third, and biggest one, is that there isn't a single structure that organizes everything. 
Just as there isn't any single node that organizes any given structure, there isn't any structure of structures. There are multiple structures interacting with each other and the physical world, but not in any organized fashion, or at least none that we know of. So you can have a structure of free market economics and a structure of discourse and the structure of natural sciences and democracy and storytelling, religion, law and so on and so on. It's also important to keep in mind that we're only treating structures as something that exists, but they themselves are just concepts, something that we've created to help us think. But they are not some metaphysical beings that lie underneath our reality and create it. What's in it for us? In the introduction we've framed postmodernism as an answer to a question posed by structuralism. And the question is, what if there is no essence within beings and it all depends on relations? Now that we know it, we can try to engage with postmodernism which takes it as a base assumption. But if you only know this common sense essentialism that is prevalent in everyday thought and try to look at postmodernism in its terms, well, everything will seem scary and chaotic and nihilistic. Most importantly, we may confuse things being relative with things being arbitrary. But what structuralism teaches us is that the thing that fixes each node in place is relations. So every node is stable precisely because it's relative to all the other ones. Things don't change chaotically, but they also don't change mechanistically. They change according to the rules of the whole structure. Of course, postmodernism goes much further. Social constructs have emerged from the sociology of knowledge, performativity of gender relies on discoveries of the so-called performative turn, and the way Derrida analyzes the structure of texts or concepts has less to do with finding structural connections and more with pushing the boundaries of how they can be formed. But all of these approaches start from structuralist perspective, even if they treat it as baby's first philosophy. Another thing. The divide between essentialism and structuralism is echoed both in the difference between common sense thinking and the methodology of social studies, as well as in right-left politics. While in the first case it only comes from a lack of deeper thought, in the latter it strongly informs the ethics of a given side. Structuralism and its descendants will find their home near the left of the spectrum because they're focused more on analyzing the society and the environment that an individual lives in, and less on the individuals themselves. Right-wing will focus more on their characteristics. Maybe they're born better, or they've tried harder at becoming a better person. Either way, what makes them morally good or evil is inside of themselves. A guy stole something? Lock him up. He's essentially evil, so we can only punish him, not change him. The best we could hope for is that his example will scare the other evil people into submission. Is a politician corrupt? Lock her up. She's essentially evil. But if we lock up all of the essentially evil ones and replace them with essentially good people, we'll finally be able to drain the swamp. Also, depending on your ethical system, sometimes changing society for the better may not be... good, actually. Sure, with increased social spending, these essentially evil people will commit fewer crimes, but that also means that we have more evil people in the society at large. We've cured the symptom temporarily, but not the disease. We've just spent money for them to avoid some punishment that they had coming. On the other hand, if you look at people from the leftist point of view, as mostly products of the society around them, the environment and the social system becomes the most important factor. A person stealing or a politician being corrupt is just an individual expression of a structural problem. The greatest evil becomes shaping the society in a way that causes individuals to commit evil acts. The greatest good then lies not in punishing these individuals, but by changing the structure of power flows in the society in such a way that these acts no longer take place. So that's an ethical difference. What about the ethical choice we mentioned at the beginning? Well, you can still agree with the tenets of structuralism, but live your individual life in a more essentialist fashion. You can believe the moral values are something that exists independently or that a person or a country are self-contained and constant beings. Because structuralism is ultimately just an analytical tool and these tools don't give a moral direction. They don't answer the question of ethics, how to live my life. 
Some people just need to have an actual defined beauty, god or country around which they can build their lives. Others feel fine with a structure devoid of a particular center because they can derive the beauty or meaning from the whole of it. You can't really say that one ethical approach is objectively better just because of analytical tools. Finally, let's offer our simplified decolonial perspective on philosophy as an academic discipline, especially the historical approach to it. First, it's not the history of thought, it's just a history of a particular mode of thought. We believe that it is something that everyone should know, at least a bit, in the same way that history of the Western Europe is. Because that's the history of the culture that has shaped our world today. Western philosophy is not better. It just achieved success along with its culture. And saying that this success proves that Western philosophy is better shows an absolute lack of understanding what philosophy is. Philosophy is not a hammer or a spade or a plunger. It's not a tool to do something. Philosophy is the art of thinking itself. And if someone judges it by who makes the biggest missiles, they reduce all of human reason to simply another device on the factory line. If it proves anything, then only the abject poverty of their own thinking. But while Western colonizers can be blamed for not caring about the cultures they were destroying, Western philosophy didn't even really know or care that other philosophies existed. To use the conversation analogy, these other philosophers were too far away from the people talking to contribute in any meaningful way. We can't outright blame them, but we also can't let the system off the hook, because the same structural problems still exist today. It's true that we can't integrate all these other philosophies into the conversation, but that just underlines how narrow-minded this conversation was. The holistic approach used by structuralism is just one example of notions popular elsewhere which were ignored in Western thought. Some of the others are looking at processes instead of static beings, or cycles instead of straight progressions, and finally, the big one, human communities instead of atomized individuals. We now have the potential to join these multiple conversations into one, but that's not an easy thing to do. They had their own histories and followed their own rules. But when we listen to more voices and consider more thoughts, there's really nothing to lose and everything to gain. One final note on what we call the Western philosophy. Its history wasn't all that Western. While Plato and Aristotle are absolute household names now, they had been lost to the West for centuries since approximately early Middle Ages. Aristotelian philosophy was being maintained in the Islamic world and reintroduced to Europe only around the 13th century. Plato, meanwhile, was low-key always there, but wasn't really talked about outside of the Byzantine Empire until the Renaissance in the 15th century. Sure, the Middle Ages weren't as dark as we've been led to believe by Renaissance folks, but there's a reason why many single-volume introductions of philosophy have maybe like one or two names between the 4th century Platonist Augustine of Hippo and 13th century Aristotelians, like Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas. Or at least that's one way to think that through. Hello there! Yep, it's still me, Panen, with few things to mention to close up this episode. First up, many thanks to our generous donors, also known as Glucose Guardians, at Patreon who are bankrolling this whole operation. Big thanks, big love, and big appreciation. If you are not a patron yet, you might consider becoming one. Maybe. Just a thought. To think through. Hey! In the meantime, please push the like button, smash that subscribe, hit the bell, and domestic abuse that share button. And now, for other news, this episode is somewhat based on our Polish version, but updated and extended by about 15 minutes. The OG version was lacking the last part about history of philosophy, as well as entire sixth chapter. We hope we got everything right, as just two white guys from the tail end of Europe. If you are still hungry for more structuralism, there is an excellent video by Tom Nicholas with a different approach to the subject. Anyway, next bit will be about hegemony, as it is essential in order to talk about the degrowth. But while doing that, we will try to say something more than just talk about Antonio Gramsci. Like also include Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Laclau. You know, the cool modern philosophy to use in everyday life. Well, that's all for today. Hear you next time. Bye.